Hello and welcome back to the American Ultra Stock channel. Thank you so much for all of you that are tuning in today. As you can see, we have a very special guest. We have Pete from the 11 Yanks. Thank you so much, Pete, for joining us. It's an honor to have you around here. And as you see on Brandon's background, the Copa America, it's approaching. It's the most meaningful competition we're going to have, a competitive opportunity to test out our team before the World Cup. Really important one. It's coming up. So we're going to be doing an analysis on expectations that we have for the USMNT this summer. Straight to the point, Pete, uh, I'll go to you first on the roster. Do you think we're going to see any surprises? Do you expect Greg trying to pull any MLS lifers here? The recent call <laughs> is pretty good. So do you think it's going to follow that line or do you see any surprises coming in? Um, I don't know. But first of all, you know, thanks for having me on. I'm I'm excited to be here, and you guys do great work. And uh, we met in Austin at the Trinidad and Tobago game. But real quick, I just wanted to preface this with when we were talking to uh, to Brett Brett Oppenheim, who invited us all about coming. He was like, "Make sure those American Ultra Talk guys come too, because they knew about Christopher Lund before anybody else did." You know, so I was like, dang, I got to I got to watch these guys because, you know, they're ahead of the curve. They're they're knowing about potential prospects. So, um, yeah, it's, a, you know, and you guys were great. And it's just it's always good to see new YouTubers coming into the space and creating content because, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats and the more content, the better. And you guys do great work. So, yeah, I'm excited to be here and um, I hope you guys continue to grow and, you know, become more and more a part of the content creator community for USMNT because there isn't enough out there, you know? I feel like every NBA team has more commentator or like content creators than our national team does, you know? Um, so yeah, gosh, I don't know. Copa Americas. The rumor this morning was that it's going to be 26, not 23, right? So I don't know when you guys are planning to release this video. Um, it might be 26 by the time this video comes out. Like it might be confirmed. But I'll say this, as far as MLS lifers, I think we all know Miles Robinson is going to be there, right? Like, does anyone think he's not going to be there? I'm with you. I think that Greg's going to take him. I don't think that, especially since he scored. When he scored that goal right before he got the call up, I knew that he was going to be part of the roster. And I think yeah. that's way too much. And I think you're, you're right. As we were reading, I'm fairly certain it's going to be 26. So maybe he can nick one or two more MLS lifers in there. But I'm yeah. with you that miles would definitely be there who else do you think would be included if he was to call in so if it's 26 i think there are several things i think that if it was just 23 i'm not convinced he'll bring in a second right back after joe scally you know i think he might have gone well we can make it work with the wingers that we have you know and the midfielders that can also play there and then he'll bring lund um but now that it's 26 i have a feeling he's going to call in another right back if it is 26. And I don't think that right back is going to be Brian Reynolds because I think Brian Reynolds is going to the Olympics. and I don't think he'll call him in for both. So I think, you know, I don't know who he's going to call. I know Shaq Moore has been injured for a while and supposedly he's supposed to come back in mid May. You know, my personal feeling is that Shaq really needs to focus on a complete recovery. Like, you know, I love Shaq Moore and I just want him to no really to focus on getting healthy for Nashville. Um, DeAndre Yedlin came off of the last Cincy game injured. I don't know how serious it is. Do you guys have any info on that? I don't think so. I don't, I don't know if it's too bad, but, but I'm not completely sure on the timeline. Let me see if if um, if uh, Fought Mob has a quick. I'm actually uh, just checking now. It doesn't look like there's anything on Fought Mob, which would probably indicate that it's not too bad. Okay. So I think if Shaq Moore is injured and he, you know, even if he's back, you know, 10 days before the roster drops, he probably won't make it because he's been out for a while. So that leaves probably either DeAndre Yedlin or if you're going to bring an MLS right back, and this is my opinion, I don't want any of them there because I don't think any of them are good enough. But if you're going to bring one, I'd probably rather see Brooks Lennon than DeAndre Yedlin because to me, DeAndre Yedlin offers nothing except pace and at least brooks lennon has some element of creativity to his game he's a very good crosser of the ball he does score goals for for a right back he gets a lot of goals and assists and yes it's mls 
But but of the options, I think I would rather see Brooks Lennon than anybody else. Of course, my personal feeling is we shouldn't. There's no point in bringing just somebody to just fill out the roster, in my opinion. You know, uh, I don't know. What do you guys think? I I actually think he was gonna take Yedlin if he's calling yeah. in. I think that he he'll be set on that. It seems like he's one of his boys, and there's the whole experience uh, factor that he can fall back on. Even though this whole squad now has World Cup experience, so I feel yeah. Like- well, experience, and then he can also claim chemistry with Miles because they play <laughs> together. At <laughs> no, it's true. These are the arguments we heard in the last cycle, right? Not always from Greg, but from a lot of his proponents, right? Strange, strange claims. <laughs> so you just don't know, you know. Yeah, what do you think, Brayden? Do you think that he's going to call up Yedlin or? Yeah, I actually have a a, a different one, uh, a little bit different. I think Daywan Jones has a bit of a chance, just because we've seen him with the group in the past, uh, especially a lot more recently than some of the other players. I think Brooks Lennon is the one that a lot of the MLS fans want because he's probably been the best performing one within MLS. And if you're looking for the player in the best form. I'd definitely take Lennon out of those pretty bad options, to be honest. But I think it'll either be Jones or Yedlin. If Yedlin's healthy, it'll probably be him just for the experience. And like you said, Pete, his chemistry with Miles Robinson, maybe that was in his mind when he was getting traded to Cincy from there in Miami. It's yeah, maybe. Basically it's the only th- yeah, it's yeah, basically, it's basically the only thing that would make that trade worthwhile to him, going from playing with you know some of the biggest stars in the world to – the middle of Ohio playing with Roman Celentano and Matt Miazga. I feel like that, that a potential US MD call is probably the only thing keeping him in that in that mind space to potentially go to Cincy. Any shouts for Julian Gressel? Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm nervous. You know, there's another spot that I'm I'm becoming nervous about now. If Tyler Adams is not fit and Leonard Maloney is still injured. You guys know who I'm thinking, right? Acosta? Yeah, <laughs> I think <laughs> he's going to bring Kellen Acosta if it's a 26-man roster. Because I think the 26-man roster benefits guys like Brendan Aronson and Luca De La Torre more than anyone because they're kind of on the fringe where you feel like they could be there. They offer some value, both of them very different kinds of value. But they're not absolutely crucial to the team. you know. And so with 26, you hope – that it would be like, okay, Brendan Aronson and, you know, Luca Del Torre. But I think more likely it's going to mean Kellen Acosta and DeAndre Yedlin, you know. I agree with you. I think that I could picture him calling up Acosta because uh, the younger guys like Esmond and Buzio, they're going to be off to the Olympics. I think it's better for them to be in the Olympics than be sure. with that people apart. And uh, I think that we should – truly consider that there is a chance that Tyler is not going to be at Copa America. And if he is, I believe he's going to be in some type of minute restriction because all these little setbacks after the injury. Yeah. So, yeah. That, that is a position that I haven't even taken into consideration on being a suspicious one, but the cost is it's in the works. Definitely. So I would actually bring Tyler, a half fit Tyler Adams because Okay, he's he's also the captain, right? And you can make some. I, I mean, I'm not a big fan of the eyes and vibes call ups, right? That we've that they tried to propagate in the last cycle. But Tyler Adams actually is an eyes and vibe call up, even if he has a limited playing time because he is the captain. He is a guy that you. So for me, it's like be an eyes and vibes guy, but you, but it only matters if when you step on the field, you can actually contribute. The idea of bringing, like, then just bring a motivational speaker on the, you know, coaching staff. Like, I don't, I don't under, there's no, there's no other national team in the world. Like, can you imagine if Brazil was like, we are calling up X guy who's not good enough to play for Brazil, but, but because he has a great Samba style. Like, I don't, you know what I mean? There's no, it doesn't happen. So it's a very strange argument to me, but Tyler Adams can actually contribute. Of course, we don't know how healthy he's going to be. Right. So it's like if he can't go at all, would you guys be in favor of him just occupying a spot on the roster? I would, even with a minute restriction. What do you think? And I would rather, have, like you said, a have fit Tyler Adams. Because I think that even if we are going with the 
Eisen vibes. Uh, he's still the captain, so he can still help with being the backbone, giving the guys some some uh, confidence and tenacity. So I would rather have him. What do you think, Braden? Yeah, I think for sure. I'd ha I'd rather have Tyler Adams on one leg and one arm than have Acosta there. My concern is that Greg might overplay him, like we kind of saw in the last camp. He was pretty good with the minutes restriction, but I think overall he probably should have only played 45 minutes as opposed to getting basically 45 in both games. And maybe that contributed to him getting re-injured at Bournemouth. Maybe his body just wasn't ready to come back. I mean, we saw it when he tried to return early in the Carabao Cup. He got re-injured. Uh, that's mainly my main concern that Greg would overplay him because he seems to be so reliant on Tyler, even though we have options like Johnny there. I mean, last camp was the perfect opportunity for Johnny to go out there, start a game, get 135 minutes in a camp, maybe even more depend because we ended up going to extra time against Jamaica, but he didn't get that opportunity. And I think if Adams is there, regardless of how fit he is, unless he has like a broken leg or something, then he'll probably end up being the starter or at least get one half in every game we play. So that would be my main concern there, but I'd rather have him than Acosta at any level. So if he can't play at all, though, let's say he's not fit. Um, technically, Bournemouth can deny the call-up and say, no, we're, we're not sending him, you know, because if they have, like, medical evidence that he can't play, then you wouldn't be able to bring it, you know? And if I was Bournemouth, I would want Tyler to have the summer off, right? They paid money for this guy. He hasn't played for them almost at all. And his injuries are concerning. So they might go, you know, look, we need this guy to have the summer off to rest, to recuperate. He can do his physical therapy with us and hopefully get him back ready for next summer, which is very reasonable, I'd say. Um, do we know anything about Leonard Maloney's injury and when he's back? I was just looking it up, actually, before the recording. I haven't seen a, an official update, but mm. uh, from the, the injury type, it looks like he is going to be back. And he had an interview, actually, that came out with The Athletic right around the time that he did get injured. It looks like he will be back by, by Copa America. It doesn't, I don't know how soon by Copa America. He might be out for the rest of the season with Heidenheim. He might not, but it looks like he will be fit, at least at, at some level, enough to get a call up for Copa America. Yeah, he's not he sounded really confident that he'll he'll be involved. So I Good. think, yeah. So I'm I think we'd all rather have Leonard Maloney than Kellen Acosta. As as much as you can say about Leonard's, you know, technical deficiencies, I'd still say they're much better than Acosta's. You know, plus he can deputize as as an emergency center back if you need him to. And honestly, I wonder if long term a left footed center back with top five league experience is not something we should consider him for you know, which is where he started his career with Dortmund too. Yeah. On the interview, he actually mentioned that to him playing as CDM is still not his natural position, that he feels good there. He feels comfortable there, but he talks a lot about the transition going from a center back into center mid center defense. Yeah. yeah, you're right. Maybe he is the solution because I think the post ring era is looking kind of gloomy as of now, really. Yeah, no, I agree. It's especially for left footed center backs. I mean, we have Austin Trusty, who is ostensibly probably a championship level center back at this point, but I think maybe a Bundesliga. Like, you know, I know people are like, oh, look how badly Sheffield United did, but also he was player of the season in the championship last year for that for Birmingham. Was it Birmingham? Yeah, it was Birmingham. So yeah. there's no there's no reason for me to think he could go to a slightly less intense league like the Bundesliga or the French league and do well, you know. In which case, great, we've got an option there, and he is left-footed. Yeah, I agree, and the fans loved him at Birmingham too. They yeah, he was voted uh, fans' player of the season too, and yeah, so I think that going back down there will probably benefit him a lot. I'd rather watch him get consistent playing back there, even though it's a weaker league, than be a bench in the Prem. And I don't think he would get a Prem move after this season either. So, um, yeah, I don't think he's at that level, and that's fine. You know. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I think that, well, going forward, you mentioned the, C the CDM position. Going forward in the wings and the 10 position, I think it's just Gio and Tillman, really, that one picks itself. Do you think in the wings where there's a lot of debate, some people think it's really weak, some people think it's not. We got the emergence of Haji. Do you, who would you call up for the wings, Pete? I guess it depends what we're planning on doing with uh, Wea, right? So obviously, Wea should be caught up as a winger. Wea, Pulisic, Haji. If we're taking four wingers, I guess for me, the only question is that fourth winger spot. What do we do with it? Right? There are options, you know, but which one? There's Brendan Aronson, 
seems like the most likely at this point because a lot of the other ones are under 23, like Paredes, Booth. You know, there's potentially Zendejas, who is playing very well in Mexico, but it's hard to shake that Gold Cup performance out of your mind when you think about Zendejas, you know? Yeah, also long term, I don't think that Zendejas is really a winger. I think if he was to get a move to Europe, I think he does better when he's more when he's played more centrally for America. Mm. So I think that and yeah, the Gold Cup's too fresh in my mind too to get <laughs> on the roster again. What do you think, Braden? Would you advocate for Aronson to be the fourth one? Well, I'm always gonna advocate for Aronson just because of personal bias. But I think that Are I you think a he's Philly a fan? I am a Philly fan. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's mainly the, the reason. But I, I do think, especially if it is 26, which it looks like it will, I think Aronson's a lock for the roster. We saw him be an injury replacement after getting left off for the first time in who knows how long yeah. uh, and come in. So I think he's definitely part of that core group. He was he was for the World Cup. He's going to be uh, as a rotational player. And he provides versatility, some of the most in that wing group, because he, he can play center mid as well, which is another option. He's not the greatest defensively, but he did do all right against Davies when we played Canada. So not maybe not as a six, but someone who can come into the midfield if we are missing players due to injury because our center mid group for the defensive mids, attacking mids, the eights, they all seem to get injured way too much. So maybe he could be an option there. I was actually considering Zendejas as a potential option on top of Aronson. It just kind of really depends on the injury situation. If we are missing one of Adams or Maloney, Maybe Aronson gets moved into the mid midfield group. We bring Sendejas in. Maybe we don't bring nine defenders. I think it's likely that we do, just based on Greg's past call-ups. We've only seen him call up 26 men one time, and that was for the World Cup. He brought way too many fullbacks. I think four right-backs were in that group. Which, you know, less said about that, the Watch, better. Watch, he calls the same four. Oh, he can't call the same four because Dest is injured. <laughs> but he calls <laughs> Lennon, Moore, and Yedlin. <laughs> yeah, and Dewan Jones takes Dest's spot or something. I wouldn't even doubt it, but yeah, who knows? Honestly, I think then Zendejas is one of Greg's guys as well, and we know he's been with the groups, at least from the, so, so, uh, been around some of the team from a very young age. He's good friends with some of the players, and that, like you said, he could be an eyes and vibes guy to, to bring into the roster, and he hasn't been, been in good form too, so there's justification. I will say, though, Greg has never called up Zendejas. All of his caps came under Hudson and BJ. And maybe, you know, again, we don't know how much Greg was behind those rosters or what it's possible that he was. But I guess we'll see. Um, for me, I think Aronson works as a late game sub when you're defending a lead. Like, I wouldn't sub Aronson on if we need a goal because I just don't know if that's necessarily, you know. But if we're 1 0 up, let's say, and in the 82nd minute you sub off Geo for Aronson, I'd be fine with that, you know. Yeah, I think that's really his role, really, as a super sub for Harrison. I think that's what fits him. I, I know some people like to say that he should start, but uh, I think after the season... Who's he going to start over, though? Yeah, so, some people really like him. And I'm not saying you, Braden, but some people I see online that I really like to to fanboy him. But I think that as a super sub, and it's fine, I think he works like, like that, really. The tenacity that he puts in, the work rate, something that's always going to be an argument for him. So, yeah, late on in the game, if you need to defend the lead... Or if you're trying to pull, blump in as many players forward as well, I think that he's fine. He's more technical than some of the other guys who may have uh, around. So I'm fine with him as a super sub too. Uh, now, moving on to the striking position. This is one that a year ago, well, a little bit over a year ago, we thought this was the, the biggest uh, weak link that we had. Now we have emerged of a bunch of nines as well. But again, injuries for Sargent. Uh, who would you call up for, for the striking position? I'm so torn. Like, part of me wants to call all three, right? Pepe, Balogun, and Sargent, because both Sargent and Balogun can also play wide. It's not their best position, but they can. But the question, the Olympics complicates everything. If there was no Olympics, I'd be like, call, if we have a 26-man roster, call all three of them up. You have more quality in the team. You have more options. Sargent can also be a late-game defensive player, too, on the wing, believe it or not. Like, you know what I mean? If you're trying to defend a lead, you get Sargent's ability in the air, he, his work rate, his physicality, he's always pressing. Um, so he's not just good as a goal scorer, even if that's his primary role. But if I would not hate seeing Pepe at the Olympics because that group needs a nine. Duncan Maguire ain't going to cut it. And Pepe is young enough that he wouldn't take up an overage spot either. 
So it kind of feels like the best fit. Now, if that meant Sargent and Balogun at the Olympics and no Pepe, I think there are some people who would be upset. And 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 understandably, I think there's an emotional connection to Pepe, right? Based on what he's done and the times that he's rescued us, you know. And I understand that, but it's like this is the advantage of having a a, a quality player pool or a, a player pool that's growing in quality is now there's really serious competition for spots. Nobody's guaranteed anything apart from probably, you know, nine or 10 guys probably are guaranteed pretty much a spot in the roster. So somebody's going to have to get cut. I mean, I don't know what, like I would honestly be fine with leaving either Sar. Like if, if they left Sergeant at home and brought Pepe, I would be disappointed because Pepe couldn't, couldn't then go to the Olympics, right? If they left Pepe at home and brought Sergeant, like I don't know if I would be too pissed either way. I'd be fine with two out of those three. I mean, to be clear, I, I think Balogun needs to go. As bad as his form is, I think quality-wise, it's it's just you still bring him. You know, I, I think there's too much quality there to not bring Balogun. Um, do you guys think there's a chance Pepe could play in both? Because it's not like PSV needs him so bad. That's what I'm hoping for, because historically, PSV has been really good with releasing their players. Even early on, back in the 90s, they released their players for the Olympics. And I think, like you said, when we saw the biggest test that that group had against France, Duncan McGuire wasn't there. He was really bad that game. Uh, and that age was either him or Johan Gomez, so a bit like a glove, not under an overage spot. I think that he should play both, because he hasn't had that many minutes this season either. doesn't have a, a history with injuries, so I'll be fine with him in, in both, really. Uh, what do yeah. you th do you think you play them both and uh, on what Pete said? Would you take all three or would you leave one of them home? Yeah, so I, I think what you need to do before making any decisions is talk to PSV because he did have that interview. It has to be said. I don't know how happy PSV were about it. Where he came out, him and his agent both came out and said his playtime this season really hasn't been what they thought or what they expected, and they, they, it looks like they were kind of criticizing PSV a little bit. So. There is a world where PSV spite him and don't let him go to both, which I think is completely fair. I mean, at that point, you're missing the entire offseason. You don't really have any time to rest and recover from the year or play in preseason for them. And I think as such a young player who hasn't really gotten a lot of minutes, playing in preseason could be something important. But I think whatever competition he's at, he needs to get minutes. So if, PSV, if PSV say he can go to both, great, bring him to both. But if they say you have to pick one, I'd pick the Olympics because – like you said, if he's not at Copa America, it could be a little bit of a disappointment, sure, but it's not too big of a loss because we do have Sargent to come in, who's been an excellent form, and we do have Haji Wright, who should be there as a winger, but in an emergency, he can play striker as well. And I, I, I rely on Haji. I'm confident that he can come in and, and save us. We saw him do it against Jamaica. Having Pepe not on the roster isn't too big of a loss, and I think it'd be a bigger loss to not have him at the Olympics, both for performance-wise and to get him into form before the season. Real quick on Haji, I have a question for you guys. Do you think the best solution to Serginho Dest absence is moving Weah to right back and letting Haji start at the wing? That's a million dollar question. Uh, me and I, we had that, that talk. I think as soon as Serge was confirmed to have torn his ACL, uh, honestly, I feel like playing a, against a good club, uh, against a, a big country, yes, I, I think I would go with that because I think that Weah can hold up defensively. He has a he has played there, and I think that he holds up just the experience that he has, the pace that he can rely on if he gets beat, and just the quality going forward as well. If we need to overlap, I don't think that Scali brings as much going forward. I think everyone knows that he doesn't bring as much going forward. With the way that we're used to playing, just lumping in crosses for as bad as it is, I think that way it would be a better fit, really, at right back and Hodges lots. Of well, plus also our first two games are against teams that are probably going to be sitting quite deep, right? Panama and Bolivia. I don't know if either of them pose a major attacking threat. So wouldn't you want both Haji and Wea on the field then to try and help overload that, you know, those wings and, and try to, you know, get in dangerous areas, use their talent, their technique. The thing is you could say, yeah, defensively Scali could probably hold up against Bolivia or Panama, no problem. But do you want him playing against those teams? Right. There's a universe where you go, I don't know if, where, if Scali plays at all in this, you know what I mean? Unless it's as a late game sub to def help defend. You know what I mean? Like 
Do you want Scally defending against Darwin Nunez? I'm not sure I do. You know, or Vinicius Jr. potentially, you know. It's like, I, I don't know. Like, he should definitely be in the roster. But how much should he play is the question. Yeah, and people will feel like he's getting hard done by, I think. But it's kind of like Duke, Luca De La Torre. These guys, this is the benefit of our, like, that our ceiling and the floor of talent is always raising. So the discussions for the roster is always going to be like this going now or for going going forward. I, I agree with that. I think that way of plays that right. But what do you think, Braden? I know you're not the biggest fan of way out there. Yeah, before his performance against Leal and Milan, which was uh, pretty good, I think he did well uh, against one of the top wingers in the world, I was actually in the camp of, depending on the opponent, uh, like you said, if we're playing a team that's going to sit back like Bolivia and potentially Panama, I think way at, at right back is smart to try to get the attacking quality that we lose because Dest is out. But I think against a top opponent, I don't want Wea to get overcommitted going forward because his primary role for the U.S., all he's ever done really, is play winger. And I think it's a risk that potentially he could get caught out. We've seen it happen with Dest at, at the highest level, especially against the Netherlands. I think he got caught out a lot out of position and that ended up costing us on counterattacks. I actually would leave Wea on the bench start Pulisic and Haji on the wings, probably Pulisic on the right to, to accommodate Haji. And he's been playing there all season. I think he can do just a, a good job on the right as he can on the left. We saw that against Jamaica. I actually thought he was more dangerous once, once Haji came on and he shifted to the right wing and have Scali defend. And especially the versatility that Wea brings. Scali can only play right back or maybe left back, but we're not going to need him there. Haji, realistically, he can only play left wing or potentially striker. Having Wea to come on as a sub for either a winger or for a scally, I think is a valuable piece to have off the bench. So you would start Haji over Wea in Copa America. Interesting. Yeah, I would. Interesting. All right. I like it. I like Braden coming, putting your flag in there and saying no. Because there are a lot of people that will disagree with you. Even me. I I, I would start Wea. I just think Wea is um, – Whatever you could say about his club form, he's generally delivered for the national team in big moments. So it's hard to bench it. But Haji's having an amazing season and more recently has good performances for the national team. Yeah, and I think that after this roster talk, all of these things that we've mentioned in the group stage, when the, the thing actually starts, and when we, we have a very favorable start of the, the campaign against two matches that we should win, really. Yeah, yeah. But expectations going into that third game if you guys want to expand on the first two as well but do you think that we should expect to top the group we know that uruguay has been on red hot form but against ivory coast they did look they, they are fragile in terms of depth uh, sometimes and they play it a very weird way as well they don't really have that many wingers do you expect us to cause a surprise and is that a marquee win if we beat them Pete? for me no it's not a marquee win and I say that because Uruguay, you know, obviously now Bielsa is coaching them. And so that kind of elevates them in people's mind. And I know they got these wins against Brazil and Argentina. And certainly they're a very dangerous team. But let's not pretend that this is a team filled with world-class players in every position. They have a few world-class players, but they also have a lot of Liga Mekis players on there. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like it's this... Brazil where you know they're stacked three deep in every position with like world-class player they're not and you know El Loco Bielsa is getting the most out of this team right now in many ways and that's a testament to good coaching because remember Uruguay didn't get out of their group in the World Cup so I don't know why and we're at home that's the other advantage that we have so I don't know why some people act like this Uruguay team is just this formidable they're a very good team and they're going to be very difficult to play against but we're at home you could argue that although the ceiling of their talent is higher than ours, I think we have a higher floor if you look at both rosters side by side. And maybe when the rosters come out, we can compare them. So I think we should be expecting to beat them at home. And I think Greg needs to be more under the microscope than he has ever been because it's not just about this tournament, right? Greg being hired was a major fiasco again, right? First time was a fiasco too, but again, so and they tried to justify it by saying, you know, this is the guy that we believe is going to help us to beat big nations in big tournaments or something to that effect. That was Matt Crocker's. So, okay, you've never done that though. Greg has never proven in five years. He's never beaten a big team in a friendly or not, right? All he's ever done is drawn against England. That's probably his biggest ever 
you know, and we did that back in 2010 with a significantly worse roster under Bob Bradley, who also beat one of the best national teams ever, by the way, in their peak, Spain. Um, so Greg should be expected to uh, to top the group, I think. But before we even get into Uruguay, I think Bolivia and Panama are actually going to be a lot more difficult than we think, simply because Bolivia is used to playing giants week in and week out, you know, in South America. They're like the worst team in South America, but they get results at home. And yeah, the altitude probably plays a part, but they know how to play defensively. They know how to make your life difficult. They know how to scrap for a point. Conversely, we are very bad at breaking teams down. I mean, let's not like, let's just look recently at teams that bunkered against us. It took us 90 minutes. We were there, right? 90 minutes to break down a 10 man Trinidad and Tobago at home. 90 minutes before we finally scored. Like that would be, you know, pilloried. Any other national team, serious national team with actual media would be pilloried for that. And then we go down to Trinidad and Tobago and lose. And then we come back home against a Jamaica missing seven of their best players. And we look like a disaster for 90 minutes. Like we don't have no clue. And we get so lucky that they score an own goal that then gives us half an hour for Gio to come and work out the kinks, Gio and Haji. So our recent history, and frankly, all of Greg's history suggests that he doesn't know how to break down a low block. I mean, starting Gio will help if he starts him at the 10, right? But even then, the way that Greg plays is very predictable. It's very easy to defend against if you are have a good game plan, a good tactical game plan. And I think these teams are going to be tougher than we think, even though they shouldn't be with the you know, the gap in talent. I don't know. What do you guys think? Uh, I expect us to beat them just because of the talent. I, I think that Bolivia, back when they had Marcelo Moreno, which is the Brazilian uh, Bolivian duel on that, for a while, he scored against Argentina, would score. He topped the goal scoring, uh, goal sc- scoring leaderboard actually for the last qualifying campaign in Common Ball, which is remarkable as a Bolivian to do that. But now I think they, they will really miss him. It's the first time they're going to be playing a major tournament without him, and they were really reliant. But having said that, as you said, we are incredibly bad playing low blocks. I always feel like we play better uh, when we're playing better teams because yeah. then we have space. Uh, and Greg's fluidity, if you want to call it that, of just crossing him and maximizing on really the talent that we have to bail him out, it comes through. But playing against a low block, that's when you really see how a manager sets up, plan Bs, Plan C's, uh, how does the transition look? Uh, what are the st- types of spaces you're looking for? And that only shines through if Gio's playing, because then, well, he's the player. He's the player doing the work, really. I think it will be tough, but if we don't beat them handily, too, as well, I'll be a little disappointed. I know it will be, maybe it's biased, but I think that we should beat them. I'm not too, too concerned. But, hey, you never know, really, what you're going to get with Greg. What do you think, Braden? Yeah, I'll just start with uh, Bolivia and Panama because it's the, the two lesser uh, quality of the games. I think it's what both of you guys said. I think Panama are a better team by far than Bolivia uh, when you look at their quality. But like you guys said, we have a really d- difficult time breaking down a low block and Bolivia is going to be more of a challenge than Panama is. Because if we look at like Bolivia, how Bolivia play, like you guys said, they play in a low block. They're used to playing these giants every week and even t- uh, other teams like Ecuador, Paraguay, teams like this that have a little bit of talent there that can go in and, and dominate a game, I think it's going to be really difficult to break down Bolivia. Their, their one advantage, the altitude, like you said, they're not going to have that, which is going to be a big loss for them. But I think it'll be a tough game. Maybe, like, I mean, we've seen it a lot, honestly. Towards the end of the game against these teams, they tire down and we end up scoring two, three goals, end up winning all these games 3-0. We saw it against Trinidad and Tobago. We saw it against Uzbekistan as well basically this, the same exact game carbon copied and it, it, we end up winning three nil and everyone says oh look we won three nil dominant performance but in reality it, it's not that we struggle for 80 minutes then the subs can come in and bail us out against panama th- i think we actually have a better chance because they're gonna play open we saw it against mexico uh in the nations league they dominated that game they lost three nil because mexico were clinical with their chances but they dominated that game they had 60 percent possession 18 shots five on target they easily could have won that game if they were more clinical. And I think it's going to be favorable for us because they're going to be open and, and vulnerable. Their defense is not very strong. They have one good defender, but he plays more of a wingback role for them anyway. So he's going to be involved in the attack heavily. 
we're going to have a lot of chances, probably beat them by a lot of goals because we're going to be clinical with our chances. Then moving on to Uruguay, like you said, I don't think it is a marquee win to beat them in the group stage. Do I think we will actually beat them? No, I, I think it'll be a draw. But the fact that this game is last means it probably won't end up meaning anything. Realistically, both us and Uruguay should beat Panama and Bolivia pretty comfortably, and we'll both be through the group at that point. It won't mean much. We'll, we'll probably rotate a little bit just to get some guys some game time. Uruguay will as well. And I'm, I'm expecting a pretty uneventful game for that one, if that is the case. Unless we end up drawing the Panama or something like that, and we need a result. But I, I will say, though, the quality that they have and I think their ability to beat good teams makes it so that if we were to face them again in the semifinals, which is a possible path, you never know what they could do. I think they're very capable of making it there. And depending on the draw, we could as well. If we beat them in the semifinals, that would be a marquee win because that's when it matters. Like you said, we would be at home. But to be honest, based on our fans' ability to pack out the stadium and based on how we've seen South American teams travel, I think it'll be a home game for Uruguay regardless of the occasion. I think in the group stage it will be, and I think if we played in the semifinal, it definitely would be. So going into probably a hostile environment, which it shouldn't be, but that's a a whole other conversation for a different day. I think beating them in the semifinals would be a marquee win, but in the group stage when it probably won't matter too much is not a marquee win, and and Greg shouldn't get too much praise for that. I have two – go ahead, Yuri. Were you going to say something? No, no, go ahead. Two questions. One about your Panama thing. I actually think you brought up a really good point there because Panama believes they can play with the best in CONCACAF. Like you said, they, they did it against Mexico. They did it against us in World Cup qualifying. They came to Orlando and they set up to attack and we just destroyed them in transition. Do you think they're going to learn at some point? Like, Do you think as their coach, what's his name? Thomas? Christensen. Thomas Christensen. Thomas, the Danish guy. He. Do you not think... He sits down and goes, we know the U.S.'s weakness. I've played them many times. You know, the same with Mexico. I've tried to go toe-to-toe, and we can do it, but generally we get punished by the quality, right? You don't think he's going to learn? It'll be interesting, I guess, to see. Does he then do that coming out at us? I'm fascinated to see what he does, but you're right. There's a good chance he might not bunker against us. Second, the game against Uruguay, you're right. We might both be qualified by then. But if it's we could face Brazil or Colombia, could that factor in, right? Because I think we'd all rather face Colombia than Brazil, right? So, and topping your group is at least a mark of something, too. It's like, oh, we topped our group. Do you think, what do you guys, I don't know, what do you guys, do you think that Greg is going to not care if we're first or second, if it has an impact on who we end up playing? I feel like either way, he's going to sugar-coated and silver-lined it in a way that look, we got out of the group, or he's going to say, oh, we topped the group if we do so. But I, I think that regardless of who we face, Colombia or Brazil, they're very very tough games, and, and I think that both teams will be qualified, but I still would like to see us beat Uruguay. And I think that on the Panama, on Christensen, every time that, uh, in a post-match interview, I feel like he's not he's going to be stubborn, because he always says that it's going to work eventually. Basically, hmm. It's going to work eventually. This is how we've got to play. If we want to beat beat the best, we have to play like this. I would say that pride would get in the way and he's going to try to play, which maybe does give him the best chance to try to get a result. They should get one against Bolivia at least. At least. What do you think, Brayden? I think that's interesting on the, the brazil Colombia point. And I, I think that the potential opponent in the quarterfinals will matter a lot more to the U.S. than it will to Uruguay because they've proven that they can go toe-to-toe with Brazil and beat them. I don't think it really matters to them, regardless of who they come up against at any stage in the competition. I think they're going to back themselves to win. So if they're already qualified, I think maybe we take the, the third group stage game a little more seriously than them, which would give us even more of incentive to win and even more criticism if we don't. Because I think for the U.S., there's going to be a lot of motivation to go in and face Colombia, who are no slouch. I mean, they beat Brazil as well. But I think there's going to be a lot more of an incentive to win that game, top the group, and face Colombia instead of Brazil. But you never know. It could work out that Colombia ends up beating Brazil in the group stage, and then we top the group but still have to play Brazil. Yeah, it's true. That'll, that'll be a fascinating group to watch simultaneously. Do you guys think Colombia is a marquee win if we beat them? I, I don't think so because I feel like... I don't think so either. That they're not consistent enough for me to consider them in that. I know that they have beaten Brazil recently, but they're not in that bracket for me. No, they're not. It's funny how whenever... like. 
after the Netherlands, a lot of the defense of Greg I heard is like, what do you expect for us to beat the Netherlands, right? It was a lot of like, oh, they're better than us. And it's like, yeah, but small teams beat big teams all the time in the world game. I don't think any of us are expecting to consistently beat a top 10 team in the world every time we play them. But I think it's fair to say you should set us up to give us a shot and B, we should get it every now and then, right? The same way that we have in the past. Like if you never, you never do it. Whereas other, like Morocco beat Spain and Portugal, right? And yeah, Morocco are a good team, but I don't think talent wise, they're that high above us, right? It's still, you know, Morocco. It happens all the time in, in the world's game. Like, Small teams beat bigger teams all the time. So people act like that's impossible. It's it's just not, you know. So I, it's just, it's interesting to me, like, a marquee win is a competitive, not a friendly, a competitive game against a top eight team in the world. That's how I look at it. And especially at home, you can't start lowering the bar now and being like, well, you know, because Colombia, Uruguay are that second tier that we should aim to be right right now. That should be if we were well coached. I actually believe we could be in or about that tier, right? In in global soccer because of our talent pool, maybe we're not quite there, right? We're not sure they they have a few world class players. But again, when you look at overall the, the starting eleven or even the roster, it's really not Ecuador too. That's another sort of second tier team at this point. I don't think they're marquee wins. I think especially at home, we have to expect to win those. And when people say, when I bring up expectations, I often hear people say, how can you expect that? Look at our results. It's like, yes, I agree. When I, I'm not talking about what I think is going to happen. I'm talking about the expectations that we should set for this team based on the player pool that we have, right? Like whoever the coach is, we say, based on this player pool, we think this is a realistic achievement for you. And we think this is doable if you're a good coach. And if you're not able to, to do that, then we think, oh, you know, you haven't met expectations. So it's not, we shouldn't set our expectations on the low bar that Greg has set as a coach. We should set our expectations on what we believe the player pool can do, whatever you think that is, you know. I completely agree. I think that people try to sugarcoat that loss or whenever we go up against these teams, like against Germany and the friendly, well, they're just better. But look at Japan. You use Morocco. I think Japan is a similar uh, country that we can look at. They don't aspire to. If it was a league, of course, I don't expect us to top. Or but it's knockout, knockout play. So it's a one-off game. Give yourself the best shot to at least punch above your weight. It's uh, yeah. I think that everybody hits on, and we have the talent to do so. Especially against the. I think that if we were well coached, and this is something I, I discussed with my friends as well. If in the World Cup we had a different coach, we had, let's say, Mourinho, just an example, and we lost to the Netherlands that way, wouldn't people be more critical? Uh, of course they would. They would say, well, look at the squad that we have. So that means that everyone already assumes that Greg's not good enough, but yet they're going to try to use that uh, argument of the how much worse or how much better the other team is to sugarcoat how bad the coach is. So I think that the ex expectations should be the same regardless of the manager because they're representing our country at the end of the day. I agree with you. I think that we really should beat uh, Colombia. What do you think, Brayden? Yeah, and I'll use another example as well. We, Russia, back when they hosted the World Cup in 2018, and I mean, you, obviously they had the home advantage, but I think people forget that they beat Spain, and then they were a penalty shootout away from going to the semifinals as well, beating Croatia, who have done so well, made the final that time, made the semifinals in 2022. Like you guys said, big teams lose to small teams all the time. So... There's there's an expectation uh, that we should be setting on us, especially I, I think we're better than some of these teams. I mean, we saw us comfortably beat Morocco. It was a completely different Morocco, granted, different coach, different situation with the players, but we comfortably beat them. We have the quality to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with these teams like Uruguay, like Colombia, like Ecuador. I think Ecuador is even below our level. And if we come up against these teams in games and beat them, I don't think they should be praised as a, as a huge achievement. If we had beaten England in the World Cup, that's a huge achievement. If we'd beaten Netherlands even, that would have been a huge achievement. But teams like this where on paper at least the quality, and we did a, a comparison video with our starting lineup and Uruguay's started, starting lineup, or at least the likely starting lineup pretty recently. And I think we found that on paper, we're pretty similar to them. They have the advantage in terms of coaching, maybe some chemistry as well, experience or whatever. but. 
realistically, I think the gap should be smaller than, than it actually is. And beating these teams, especially if it's in a lower level, like a quarterfinal against Colombia, that's not necessarily significant. Yeah, and I, I think it's a good time to transition on the knockout rounds because uh, after all this talk uh, about who we're going to face, I think it brings to the point where we're going to face the toughest uh, team because I think especially considering it's a quarterfinal, it'll be tougher than Uruguay, than a third game in the group stage. Uh, just going with expectations and reality, do you expect, Pete, for us to beat? How far do you think? The question is, how far do you think we'll go in the tournament ultimately? And how far do you you said that you want us to to punch above our weight. I think everybody everybody wants. But do you expect us? And I'm just going to say it right now. I, my dream matchup is for the U.S. to play Brazil. I know it's a tougher one, but as a Brazilian American, I really want the U.S. to beat Brazil. But uh, what do you think, Braden? Uh, what do you think, Pete? I just want to see that game to watch Tax face. Like the the torn nature of the ta the live watch along with Tax will be hilarious if it's Brazil versus the U.S. But. Um, so again, with expect what I think will happen, if I had to put bet my my car, okay, I think we will get out of our group and lose to either Brazil or Colombia in pretty considerable fashion in the second round. Sort of like the Netherlands, where okay, the scoreline was three one, but if you watch that game, they were in control the entire time. Even when they didn't have the ball, the Netherlands was in control, and they let us kind of do what we wanted, won it from us in the right areas, and then quickly hurt us. They, they were in control of that game. And that's, I think, what was so disheartening about that Netherlands game is like, you were never even in it. And even Van Hal afterwards was kind of like, yeah, now the tournament starts for us. These, you know, he, they dismissed us. Like we didn't, you know, and then Greg's like, ah, they have a guy who scored some goals in the Champions League. We don't have that after Pulisic had just won the Champions League and been a key play. But, but, but it's Greg. It's Greg. So I think we're going to do the bare, he's bare minimum Greg. I think we'll get out of the group. I don't think it will be pretty. I think we'll get one win and one draw before we face Uruguay. I do. I think one of those teams will get a draw, maybe Bolivia against us. And then I think we will draw with Uruguay, just like Braden said, finish second, and then whoever, they'll beat us. And then our media will try to tell us for six months that our expectations are too high and that we are toxic and that Greg twice now got out of his group in a major tournament, which proves that he's the greatest thing since sliced bread and everyone needs to shut up and wave their pom-poms and buy the $18 churros. Like that's our media, right? So that's what I think will happen, but it shouldn't be acceptable in my opinion. How far do you think we could go if everything was perfect and somehow we punch above our weight? Realistically, how far do you think we could go? I, mean, I think we can make a semifinal. You know, if let's say you get first in your group and then you play Colombia and you play the game of your life at home against Colombia, even if you have to win on penalties, I think that's very doable if you have a good game plan and the players show up and, and show up with belief and show up with fire and intensity, what we've come to know the U.S. to be before Greg Berhalter, you know, like under Bob Bradley and Bruce Arena. Let's leave the, you know, after Klinsman was fired or that last two years, let's say 16 to 18, but even Copa America 2016, we made a semifinal. Sure, we didn't beat any huge players on the way, but we beat an Ecuador and a Paraguay. And we gave Colombia hell in that semifinal game. We lost one nil, missing a lot of key players, but we gave them hell. Okay, great. Like that's what we kind of want to see. And I, I can, if we lose, let's say we play Brazil. If we lose to Brazil, but it's tight and we have enough chances and it's close and you feel like we really put up a good fight and just got unlucky, that's one thing. But getting out completely outclassed would, would not be acceptable either because, again, it's how you set up and it's how you approach the game. My worry is Greg's going to want to approach the game every, every game the same way and we'll just get punished for it. We're going to try to go out and play against Brazil, for example, and then Brazil is going to be like, okay, Watch, this is Vinny Jr. on the left, you know? Yeah, I think that any of our right backs going forward against, going up against Vinny will, will be tough. Uh, what do you think, Braden? What are your expectations and realistic outview on it? I think if everything goes right, the perfect scenario would be we win our group, we face Colombia in, this, in the quarterfinals, we beat them, I think is very achievable. Even with Greg, I think if we were to come against Colombia, I don't think that will happen. I think we'll play Brazil and lose. That would be my realistic outcome. If I, like you said, if I were to bet my car, 
I think I would say we we went we topped the sorry we finished second in the group behind Uruguay. I think we would still beat Panama and Bolivia, although very tight. Maybe a pair of one nils, a two nil thrown in there. Lose to Uruguay or or draw and lose on goal difference, and then lose comfortably to Brazil. Maybe maybe another three one like the Netherlands. Maybe even more. To be honest, I don't think it would be tight at all. But in a perfect scenario, we beat Colombia. I think if we do come against them, regardless if that somehow happens, I think we'll beat them. Even with Greg holding us back, I think we'll beat Colombia regardless. Their defense is very weak. We have our, all all of our quality is in the midfield and attack. I think we can control that area of the game and beat them. Then in the semifinal, it's either Uruguay again or Brazil. I don't think there's any scenario where we beat either of those teams in a semifinal, realistically. And going back to 2016, like you said, we made the semifinal. But I think it's very significant that Brazil didn't make it out of the group in that Copa America. I think that's something that, that kind of gets forgotten. And it, it gave us a very easy path because instead of Brazil to finish second in that group, it was Ecuador, who we ended up playing in the quarterfinals, beat them, ended up making the semifinal, uh, got beaten, dominated, completely dominated by Argentina in the semifinal, and then played Colombia, who we had already lost to in the group in the third place game. Like you said, it, it was a tight game, but in the, at the end of the day, a third place game doesn't really mean too much. I don't think it was really a big achievement for Colombia at that point. I don't think their hearts were in it. I don't think a similar thing will happen. I mean, who knows? In, if Brazil don't make it out of the group again, or Colombia don't make it out of the group, maybe Paraguay goes through. Maybe maybe we end up playing Paraguay and we fluke our way to a semifinal again. But I, I think that would be even worse. I'd much rather lose to Brazil in the quarterfinal than end up playing Paraguay and get beaten in the semifinal. My dream matchup, I can't stress it enough, would be to beat Brazil. Just to, uh, You're Brazilian, right, Yuri? I was born and raised there until I was 13. Okay. Is that tough for you watching, like, no? You'd rather the U.S. win than Brazil. Okay. Absolutely. It's not even close. I would be lying. My dad is Brazilian, full-on Brazilian, never visited the U.S. Okay. He, can you, how can you support the U.S.? But I would be lying. My heart would be lying if I said that, oh, it's kind of like the same. It doesn't come even close for me. It's uh, USA all the way. If That's my dream matchup. I would rather face Brazil and just beat them and get humiliated next round in the semifinals, then go all the way to the final. That's how much I, I want us to win that game. I think we can all safely say, if Greg beats Brazil, he has a free pass, kind of, right? For the rest, <laughs> until world until 2026. Like, if you, whatever else happens in the tournament, if you beat Brazil and get to the semifinal and then Messi spanks our asses, fine, Greg, fine. You got your marquee win. Congratulations. Well done. Now let's do, let's go further in, in 2026. But here, yeah. but I have a question for you guys. Do you think if we get grouped, because I think we can all agree, if he makes it out of the group, he's not getting fired no matter what happens, right? We all know U.S. soccer and their expectation levels. If he gets grouped, what happens? Has to be fired. I mean, this would be breaking the cycle of things that bail him out. It's not the bare minimum. We right. always just enough. So we can just buy in the media tries to put some articles out saying that, hey, it's not really that bad. Hey, let's look at reality. It's it's fine. But no, this would break the cycle because getting grouped with Bolivia and Panama. I mean, what are what are we doing here? So I I think that some people I've seen some people pray on the downfall, just like they did against Jamaica, that perhaps the best thing would have been for us to lose. But I think I don't think it would have been fired then. But if this happens, he has to be fired. Do you agree, Braden? But do you think he will be? Think it will. I think it. I think it'll be too much. I would like to have a little bit of glimp of of faith that USSF would would, would have the cojones to do that and fire him if he gets grouped. I don't think so. To be completely honest with you, I think I don't even think it's worth discussing because we all know if he gets grouped. I think even a lot of the Berhalter supporters would still would concede in that argument and be like, okay, yeah, maybe something has to go now. But I think in all of the the talks that U.S. soccer have had to the media in particular, I think it's been very clear that he is the guy till 2026. Regardless, they believe he's the best guy to take the next cycle, whether that's something that you want or not. I think all three of us are in the same camp that that is not what we want, but I think that's the reality of it. And even if we lose every game in the group stage, I think he's still the guy for 2026 because they'll say, oh, it's too close to a World Cup. We can't be, we can't be making this change with only two years when Morocco did exactly that. They made the coaching change right before the World Cup, ended up 
making the semifinal. Ivory Coast changed their manager in the middle of the AFCON and did not make it, making the final. I think they won it all, actually, didn't they? Or I can't remember if they won that final or not. But I don't think U.S. soccer would have the balls to do it, to be completely honest with you. So you're saying U.S. soccer has now just completely embraced a zero accountability mentality. Yeah, because that would be zero accountability. That would basically be like it doesn't matter what you do, you're the guy. Yeah, I I think so. And then when it comes to the World Cup, I think 100% the accountability comes back. If we get grouped in the World Cup, he'll get fired. Will anybody be watching the World Cup? Like if he's there, like if we get grouped in Copa America, (laughs) I don't know if anyone's going to watch my channel after if and he doesn't (laughs) get fired. I've seen people quit on this team in the last 18 months since Qatar. And just go, we, this clown is still in charge. And just kind of lose excitement for it. A lot of people who got excited about the U.S. and about this team in the lead up to Qatar, right? They were like, look at this talent we have now. And, and we saw it on YouTube in terms of numbers and excitement. After Qatar, after they renewed Greg last summer, I, I probably had about 30 DMs from fans just going, man, I'm done. Like, I don't want to watch this guy for another three years. And I couldn't really blame them. So if if we get grouped in Copa America, I think that would be the and he stays. That'll be the death knell for a lot of casuals and maybe even some diehards. I think only the true diehards will still watch camps. But answering your own question, do you think he would get fired if he gets grouped? Yes, I think they would be under enough pressure that they would have to fire him. As as much as I think. You know, Braden makes a good point. Matt Crocker said 2026 and beyond. Like they're acting like Greg is the permanent head coach for the next hundred or till he's dead, you know? And so I understand why Braden thinks that, but I also think that pressure is pressure. And sponsors, especially, I think, would also be putting some pressure too and be like, wait, what, what, what are we doing? But also maybe it depends on the players. I mean, the play does he has he does he lose the locker room? Right. Because we saw one of the reasons maybe that he was rehired was having the support of some key players like Adams and Pulisic and Wea. Maybe not all the players. I'm sure Gio is being professional, but I don't think Gio would hate it if Berhalter got fired. I don't think Scally would hate it. I don't think Pepe would hate it if he got fired. I think they're sort of going, well, he's the guy. He's in charge. And if I want to play for the national team, I have to you know, work with that and they're being professional, but I don't necessarily think there's this unanimous support for Greg within the player group. And Tack and I have had conversations with certain players that also back that up. But if the key leaders of the team still support him after Copa America, then it might be easier to justify. They'll get a couple of videos going, you know, where Pulisic and Adams come out and go, well, the players let him down. He's still one of the best coaches in the world. We believe in him. And at that point, and this is a question too that will, that has come up over some of his recent results. When you say this is awful, Greg has to go, people go, no, the players need to take responsibility too. And I love that phrase because it means absolutely nothing, right? It's like, yes, of course the players need to take responsibility. What is your solution? What is the practical, what does that mean practically? Fire all the players? Like you can only fire the coach when all the players are performing poorly or at least the majority of them perform below their club level performances, right? When the entire team doesn't look like it's playing up to the sum of its parts, forget greater than the sum of its parts, that's on the coach, right? So I don't like, what do you guys think, honestly, about the whole, because that's one argument that the Burhalter supporters love, and even the media loves this. When, when a result goes terribly, blame the players, you know, Greg didn't miss that goal. My take, yeah, I completely agree with you. What do they expect? Just let's all revoke these guys' citizenships and call some players. Well, Send them all to Guantanamo. <laughs> what do they expect? Uh, I had some friends say that after the World Cup. And what is the, like you said, the practical solution? What can you do to fix that if the players aren't responding on the pitch? The only sensible thing to do, especially if something like this were to happen, getting grouped in Copa America, just do the, the obvious thing. Fire the guy. And you mentioned Matt Crocker. I just want to say, oh, I don't know what that guy is on, really. But the whole world, worldwide search, and then he comes back to the same guy. Anyways, what do you think, Brayden? My favorite is the argument, and this sounds absolutely insane, but I actually have heard people use this argument. The, the squad in the Gold Cup, in, they beat Trinidad and Tobago 6-0. Then you come to the A-team, and we struggle against them. At home, we struggle, barely beat them. 
lose away. And some Berhalter fans have actually said, look, the, the players clearly aren't up to the standard that you guys are, are making them out to be. Because we saw Jesus Ferreira go score a hat trick. Maybe he should be in the team. And then they completely ignore the coaching change that BJ was in charge in the Gold Cup when we beat them. And Greg was in charge when we played them when it mattered. And I think that also is kind of part of it. I think the Nations League mattered a lot more to Trinidad and Tobago than the Gold Cup did because a spot in Copa America was on the line. But I don't, I don't think you can you can put all the blame on the players and, and give Greg a pass for some of these performances. Not sure. Some, some of the players need to take some accountability when they put in bad performances. And we've seen that in the past. When we played against Germany, Chris Richards was really bad. And then we saw him get benched uh, for the next camp. And I think that was a good thing because players do need to be punished at some point when they're putting in bad performances. But when the entire team is playing down a level that you'd particularly see, and I think especially now, I think this is the best that we've had players play at club level probably ever. I think even last season or heading into the World Cup, there were maybe a couple players who had good form at club. But realistically, I think the group has been punching above its, its weight in terms of their club form. They always show up for the national team. Now we have a lot of players. Bosik and McKenney have been sensational in Serie A. You've got Sargent and Haji, whether they'll be there or not, they have been great scoring in the goals uh, in the championship. Richards has been very good for Crystal Palace since he's come in. Dest won't be there, but he was team of the season in Eredivisie. Jedi, hey, yeah, Jedi has an argument to be team of the season in the Premier League at left back. We have a lot of players who are putting in very good performances now for their clubs. And if that doesn't translate to the national team now, then you have to look at the coach. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, it brings to, uh, I think, the final point. Uh, after everything is said and done, after Copa America is done, even if we lose to Brazil, which I don't want to think about, uh, this tournament, what would it mean? What would be a successful tournament for you, Pete? Would it be one marquee win? Would it be a run to the semifinal? Uh, this tournament for you would have been a success if we do what? What is the outcome? If that would mean it is, it was truly worth it, and we did something. I would say, okay, I would say beating Brazil or Argentina is like, wow, right? Brazil or Argentina, that is a marquee win, and it's a run to the semifinal, right? I mean, if, if you beat Argentina, you're in a final. But I'll, but I'll make a, an exception. If we beat Uruguay in the group stage and top our group and then beat Colombia in the quarterfinal and lose narrowly to Argentina in the semifinal and then beat the third place team, whoever that is, that will be a success as well. Even though technically you maybe didn't get the marquee win, but you beat two very good teams in Uruguay and Colombia. So for me, beating Uruguay and Colombia is equal to one marquee win. Like that's kind of how I'm looking at it, right? And a lot depends how you play too, right? Because even if you get out of the group and lose, let's say you squeak out of the group in second place, you draw 1-1 with Bolivia, you beat Panama 2-0, you draw 0-0 with Uruguay, and then Brazil spanks you 3-0. How you play and how you perform also matters against some of these teams, right? If it's like the Netherlands where you're just, you're never in the game, that's more of a failure than losing one nil to brazil and you hit the post twice or you lose on penalties or an extra time where you like okay you made it close fine you know so there's room for some nuance there but i cannot stress enough how much pressure should be on greg for this tournament his results and performances in his entire first cycle and even more so since he's come back have been extremely underwhelming he has not yet justified his, his rehire. He has only ever been successful at home in CONCACAF. You can't even say away in CONCACAF. And getting out of, in my opinion, the easiest group at the World Cup, squeaking out of it with scoring two goals in three games is not good enough for me either. Like, that wasn't good enough. Let's be honest about the World Cup. It wasn't. So nothing Greg has done is justified his rehiring. And I think he needs to be held to a very high standard in this Copa America in order to justify staying until the end of, of uh, 2026. Yeah, and just on that, a really quick note. People have uh, been complimentary of his call-ups, which, I mean, they should pick themselves. There are some obvious choices there. But even with the better call-ups, we're still playing the same way. So that... Yeah. If you want to compliment him on that, which I see some people do, then you have to hold him accountable for how we've been playing, even with the best players at his disposal. What about you, Brayden? What would it what would be a successful Copa America for you? I think it's pretty similar to what Pete said. 
we have to be a big team, but I'm going to stress this. I already said it earlier in the video. It has to be when it matters. If our marquee win is against Uruguay in the group stage, when they've already secured qualification, that's not a marquee win. Even if they go on and win the whole tournament, and I think that argument will be used. Honestly, my pick to win the Copa America is Uruguay right now. But if we beat them in the group stage, they end up, end up winning the tournament. A lot of fans will say, okay, that's a meaningful win because we beat them. It won't be because in that game, they won't have tried or they would have easily beaten us as shown by them potentially winning the tournament. If we can beat them in the semifinal, that's a big win. And I will say just quickly, if we were to play Argentina, that would be in a final due to the how the Copa America is set up. It's a kind of a dumb format where we would play a team that we faced in the group in the semifinal instead of the final. I don't agree with the way they set that up, but that would be the case. So if we somehow made a, a game against Argentina in a final, th that would be the dream scenario, clearly. But oh, so I, in I the semifinal, we could face Uruguay again? Yeah, it would be oh. Uruguay and, or one of the other teams from, from Group D, either Brazil or Colombia, most likely, which is kind of a dumb format, to be completely honest. But mm. it is what it is. I think if we beat Brazil at any point, like you said, Greg gets a pass. Even if we get dominated in the semifinal, if we beat Brazil, that's a marquee win. If we beat Uruguay in the group stage and Colombia, I think that's acceptable. But if we get blown out in the semifinal, regardless against Brazil, then I'm still not happy with that. We have to, we can't lose in an embarrassing fashion unless we beat Brazil, basically, is what I'm saying. So, real quick, you're telling me. There's a world where we could just beat Colombia and Uruguay and be in a Copa America final. Uh, technically, yes. Yeah, because if we beat Colombia in, in the quarterfinal and then Uruguay go and beat Brazil and we, we play Uruguay again and then beat them for potentially a second time, go to the final and probably lose 4-0 again to Argentina. I'm dreaming. I'm dreaming already now. Uh, <laughs> my mom's like, wait, so you're telling me there's a chance? <laughs> Yeah, for me, a successful tournament would just getting a marquee win. I think that I put that above beating Uruguay and Colombia because I think it's just time that we we do that. We show that we can truly punch above our weight against a team that a national team that's in that bracket, the very top. Uh, I, I understand that it's. I think it's acceptable if, let's say, we beat uh, Uruguay, beat Colombia, lose respectfully. I'm not going to say narrowly because you never know, but at least know that we were close at some point in the game. We were close. I think that's fine. But I just want a marquee win. I just want us to beat Brazil. Again, might be personal bias there, but I just can't wait for that. If that happens, I'm the happiest man alive. Can I ask you guys real quick? I don't know how much time you have, but how do you feel about the marketing for this tournament? Like, do you feel like America knows it's happening in less than a month? Like, okay, in a little over a month? So underwhelming because I have family in Italy. Everyone is hyped for the Euros. But then again, it's a region that everyone culturally is tied to the sport. But I feel like the the amount of eyes from casuals that I would expect to be tuning in or at least asking me stuff about it is very low. I feel like it has been really underwhelming. And that's probably on our media too. Yeah. Well, I feel like they're marketing it to soccer fans who already know it's happening, right? Tack said this the other day on Twitter, and I don't know if you guys know this, well, journalist, Kelvin Loyola was like, mm -hmm. why do they need to market it if they're filling up the stadium? It's just like, you know we're trying to do more than just fill up the stadiums, right? We're trying to get people to watch it on. That's what really matters. It's like MLS. Like, you know they can fill MLS stadiums. Getting people to watch on TV is what turns it into a national conversation. And there's no marketing. I don't think I've seen any Copa America ads, maybe one, you know, on a Premier League halftime game. But, like, I feel like a lot of those fans know it's happening. And I think a lot of fans and Americans who watch the Premier League are going to be watching the Euros more than Copa America. But like, why are why don't we have billboards in every city that it's being hosted in with like Pulisic, Reyna, McKenney, Balogun, like looking like absolute ballers, America's team, America versus the Americas, whatever. Like, why is that not on every major highway in every major city in this world to get America excited about this? There was more billboards, a lot more about Wrexham when they played around L.A. There were a lot more when with Rex and then this Copa America and it's crazy. Like you said, put something like let's turn Copa America into Copa America, something just something out there to hype people up. And yeah, I, I completely agree. It's just for the people that are already involved with the sport. Yeah. And that's partially on CONCACAF Conmebol, who are co hosting. But you can you can always say, oh actually, you know, US soccer is not responsible. I disagree. 
they might not have the rights to quote unquote market Copa America, but they have the rights to market their players. So, you know, you could still put America's team, right? You could do something with Fox soccer who hosting the tournament and like watch on Fox soccer, America's team. I, I just think there's so much more branding and marketing that can be done to hype Americans for this tournament. But as we know, their main aim is to fleece the existing soccer fans for every penny they have rather than try to create new ones. I think that's their strategy, honestly. And they've bragged about this in the past, right? Oh, we, we have fewer fans, but, but they pay more for tickets now. So how successful are we? Like they've bragged about this. seems like nothing's changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm going to go back to the Calvin Loyola argument that you brought up. It doesn't mean anything to fill the seats because the seats are going to be filled with the South Americans that travel to make the tournament. I already said earlier that whenever we play Uruguay, we're probably not going to be the home team in terms of atmosphere. And I think that'd be the same when, if we play Brazil, Argentina, Colombia, really any of the teams, except for probably Bolivia, I think will be a favorites against Bolivia in terms of the crowd and probably Panama as well. But it doesn't mean anything to sell tickets to South Americans who obviously they know the tournament's happening. This is their tournament. They're bringing it to the U.S. Our media is responsible for making this a big deal because the, we, don't, we aren't involved in something like this often. The last time it happened was 2016, and before that, it was, it was a long time before that as well. So th the fact that we're getting this opportunity to host and, and play against some of the world's best when – I mean, if we didn't have this opportunity, we would have no meaningful games before 2026 because we're not going to be in Con CONCACAF World Cup qualifying. And you can even make the argument that those aren't meaningful because our region's at the worst it's ever been. Mexico suck. Canada's little uh, Lynn Sanity run, as I like to call it, is kind of done. The other teams aren't up to par. Jamaica haven't figured out their federation yet. Really, those games wouldn't matter. And we won't even have those. We'll have friendlies against obscure nations like we saw with Uzbekistan and Oman. This is our one opportunity to captivate some fans because I think, like you said, on, on YouTube as well, I think I saw your numbers and tax numbers during the World Cup were so high. And the fact that we haven't had marketing, it kind of hurts us as well because fans won't be tuning in. They won't be watching us on YouTube. They won't be getting the hype of the tournament. And this is our one opportunity to start to build fans that we have two years to turn some people who haven't ever watched the sport seriously into actual fans of at least the USMNT. I couldn't care less if people watch the Premier League, La Liga, Bundesliga, stuff like that. As long as fans are, are caring about the USMNT, that's really all that matters for me. But I don't think we're seeing that as much as we should. I 100% agree. And to add to that real quick, I'll say this. Would a marquee win capture now the imagination of the casual American sports fan? Wait, we beat Brazil? Gio Reyna scored a belt. Who is this team? Are we good again? What? Ha you know what I mean? Like that has the potential to capture the imagination of the casual American sports fan and get people excited about this team leading up to 2026. So hopefully, just to end this on a positive note, I guess, hopefully we can get that, that win. And because and, that's what Americans love. The casual American sports fan loves a winner. Right. And America beating another country that's traditionally better than us at a game is something even the rednecks in Mississippi can get on board with. You know what I mean? Like people who might never watch a soccer game would be like, America, hell yeah, I'm big Polish fan right there. You know what I mean? Like that's what will happen. So let's hope. Yeah, let's definitely hope if that happens again, Brazil, I can't just dream about it. It'll be a little bit of a war zone here at home because everyone goes for Brazil, but. I really hope that happens. And I, I agree with you. That's the one opportunity we have to make all the casuals turn an eye on. They'll, they'll take, they'll at least notice. And now if they pick, pick up the sport, if their kids will have an interest, that's uh, another topic, but the opportunity will be there. But yeah, thank you so much, Pete. We really, really appreciate having you on. It was a pleasure. Really. Thank you so much. We feel honored to have you on the channel. Um, I'm not even going to tell the, the people who watch this to sub to your channel because if they're sub to us, they definitely know who you are. So, so. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> maybe you have uh, a niche audience that, you know. You never know. So if you're by any chance, any stretch of the imagination, you're not sub to Pete's channel, we'll leave the link in the description, even though I'm pretty sure the majority of you are, all of you are. But thank you so much. Thank you, Brayden, as well. Thank you guys for uh, having made this video as well. And thank you to all the viewers who stuck around and watched this far along. We really appreciate having you on. We appreciate the recent growth we've been on. And again, leave in the comments down below your takes. How do you uh, see this tournament? Do you think we have any chance to go a little farther and punch above our weight for the first time 
on Greg's cycle. So make sure to leave a like, subscribe. Any last thing you guys want to add? I just want to say real quick, guys, if you're watching this video and you haven't subbed yet to American Ultras Talk, do that. They work hard. They do good work. And do you see how close they are to 1,000 subs? If they get to 1,000 subs, they'll get monetized. That means they can get a few dollars here and there to maybe pay bus fare to compensate them for their work. So if, if nothing else, it helps to support the channel. Smash that subscribe button so that to help these guys get to 1,000. Let's do it. Thank you so much, Pete. See you guys in the next time.